Recently, Derek and I had an amazing conversation with Peter Hyatt. Peter is someone I was unfamiliar with till about two and a half years ago when I wrote an article that got me in trouble and ultimately rejected by our community. Those were painful days, also days where I began to lean into the reconciling love of God and my understanding of what that meant regarding hell. Peter Hyatt was one of the first fellas I was introduced to that was further down the road regarding the reconciling nature of God and what that might mean regarding how we perceive and understand hell. I was sent by a friend, an incredible YouTube video titled Hallelujah in Hell, and I highly recommend you checking it out. We'll have the links to that and a couple other videos that we talk about on A Family Story's Peter Hyatt link. You can go to afamilystory.org and you'll find them there. Along with all our other podcasts and 15 years of articles that I've written or invited friends to write and post on our website. Anyway, that video was incredible as Peter put language around something that I hadn't quite developed language for yet. He released grace into the conversation. Uh, eventually, I would learn about Brad Jerzak, and Baxter Kruger, Paul Young, and so many others who have fearlessly, generously, and graciously revisited hell and our understanding of it through scripture, through the early church fathers, but also in the context always of relationship, in the context of the love of God. All that to say, Derek and I went into the deep end with Peter and it was an incredible privilege to talk to him about a new perspective on how we could approach hell. We also talked about Calvinism. We talked about universalism. We talked about the early church. We talked about the empire. And we talked about relentless love, about a relational God. We talked about atonement, reformation, and Satan's big butt. Yeah, you'll have to listen to get that one. In this conversation, Peter walks us through the story of our own creation, the goodness of God's reconciling love, the relational kindness of a God who encounters, sets free, and transforms. Guys, Peter describes a God who delights in his creation, a God who destroys what is evil, creates what is good, and invites us to observe our own creation in Christ Jesus. You can learn more about Peter at relentless-love.org or on Facebook under the same name, Relentless-Love. This is a really cool conversation, and Derek and I were incredibly privileged to have him on. I think it'll be helpful, insightful, and further the conversation that, as Rod Williams mentioned, the church is whispering in the hallways. I think he might be better than we thought he was. Like, share, tweet, subscribe, write a review on iTunes, all of this stuff helps expand uh, the audience, gets this message into more hearts. And if you want to give to support this podcast, you can go to afamilystory.org. We really are honored to be on this journey with you. Love doing this podcast with you. All right. Here's a conversation we had with Peter Hyatt. So you're, you're going to ask me about tacos at the end? I'm, I am going to ask you, Rethinking God with Tacos, one of us will, will uh, ask you if you have a particular taco story. Oh uh, gosh. Yeah. It's just, in, just in fun. Just in okay. Fun, yeah. So. No, that's great. I love tacos. <laughs> so I'm all for, I'm all for tacos. That's good. Are, all know, right. Well, we- Jason's, Jason's original uh, desire for this was that we would all be sitting down eating tacos together and discussing yeah. how we're rethinking God, but the noises were just unbearable. You know, you cannot, <laughs> You can't rethink God with that kind of crunch. Oh, right. Well, yeah. but So I can't say this on the recording probably, but when we moved into this church, there's a uh, taco shop right down the street called Pinche Tacos and just incredible tacos. But And everybody was setting up meetings at Pinche and we're going to Pinche. And then we learned that Pinche means like fucking in Spanish or something. So, but, but they're incredible tacos. So anyway, if you ever come here, I'll take you down there. They, I think they had to change the name to tacos and tequila or something, but they're really okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. I, that, that would be the best taco story we've had, but I, I'll leave that to your discretion. <laughs> Well, I don't care. I but. That, we may have our introduction yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and and badass coffee just moved in across the street, so we're like the the badass <laughs> coffee. Church, so, yeah. I love it. <laughs>
I want to tell a story, but but we probably should dive in. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, let's start here. It's so good to have you uh, on our podcast. I'm just grateful to be a part of this. So that's cool. Oh, good. Before we hit record here, I, I mentioned that I've been following your content, Peter, for some time online. Um, uh, I didn't tell you this. I only write about one thing, the love of God. And a couple of years ago, as I was as, as you do, as you continue to, to awaken to the reconciling nature of the love of God. And, and as you discover what took place at the cross and that God was in Christ and that he wasn't turning his away, but that, that God was reconciling the world to himself as you do, eventually you're going to have to reevaluate your evangelical thoughts on hell. And I did that a couple of years ago and it got me kicked out of a church. <laughs> and, and that's how I got introduced to you because of course, uh, Lots of folks were like, oh, have you heard this? And they sent me uh, your video, Hallelujah in Hell, uh -huh. and uh, just blew me away. I went, this guy is saying the things that are in my heart that I hadn't put language to yet, but that I knew to be true. And so I'm so excited that you're on the podcast, Rethinking God with Tacos. It's where we, we, uh, we love to dive into the nature of who God is yeah. uh, through the lens of Jesus on a cross, reconciling the world to himself, sharing this with you. And of course, our audience knows that. Uh, and and uh, and then in, visit those places that we've begun to rethink. But before we dive into the, the deep end, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, and then uh, and then we can start having a, a heretical uh, conversation, right? Okay. So who I am? Um, if try to make this quick, I'm the uh, son of a Presbyterian pastor who I just loved. Uh, my dad was. I get choked up just talking about him. Okay. He was. Uh, very much like Jesus. So I, I, I grew up in the church and kind of realized the church was this nutty place. And I really wanted to be a geologist. I was into science as a kid and, um, but ended up going into the ministry. Um, I got a geology degree from the university of Colorado. Then, uh, went out to Fuller Seminary, worked at Bel Air Presbyterian Church, where Ronald Reagan was the president, and uh, then a place in Northern California, married my high school sweetheart, have four kids, moved back to Colorado, went to a little church on the west side of town, and over, gosh, about 14 years, it grew from 40, 50 people to a few thousand. We built a big church on the side of the road and uh, on the side of the interstate, and over that time, uh, God did a bunch of things with me um, on a whole lot of levels, like he always does. Yeah. He's got quite an agenda, God does. and But in the process, I uh, had to kind of re-examine uh, some of the things that were part of my evangelical heritage, but maybe not part of my Presbyterian heritage as much, but yeah. I had kind of come into the evangelical mainstream and was sort of seen as, uh, you know, the kind of the golden boy of Denver. And yeah. uh Anyway, the, the denomination got a little stressed about some things. They put me on trial. They asked me to state, uh, to publicly confess that there was a group of people God could not save and that there was, uh, a, that he delighted in their endless dis destruction and right. they meant endless torment. Wow. I just, I just couldn't do it. Wow. And so I was, I was defrocked and some of us went downtown and started this church called the sanctuary. And so I've been here now for 14 years, but life just uh, got really different after, wow. after that event. My goodness. They made you put a line in the sand and uh, yeah, and well, they couldn't figure out where I was unbiblical because they kept showing up and saying, you can't say this stuff. And I'd say what stuff? And they'd say, you know, this stuff. And I did know this stuff because what I would do is I, I call them the, I put it, we put it in one of those videos, a Bible versus banned by Bible believing believers. <laughs> and the more I exegeted scripture, I couldn't get around these verses. And so I would just say things in sermons like, well, he makes all things new. And at a certain point, the church had gotten really big by that point. And someone said, Hey, wait a minute. What about, what about hell? And, uh, the denomination sent people out to investigate and they they realized that they couldn't I couldn't get defrocked or removed for quoting scripture verses. So they had me state my objections to the Westminster Confession of Faith. OK. And everybody in my denomination had objections, but they found two statements that they said I wasn't in compliance with and then sort of rewrote them. Wow. And said, well, you can stay here and pastoring the church 
but you need to publicly confess these two things, which in, in my mind basically amounted to, number one, God doesn't save everybody, and number two, God doesn't want to. A- at that point, I was simply saying, I want to hope this is true. Right, right. And they said, well, you can hope it, but you can't believe it's possible. And it put me in this wild bind, <laughs> and I ended up, they put me on trial, and it, it was just crazy. Wow. I, I mean, it was really a fascinating experience, but that's how the sanctuary started. Wow. And uh, Peter, how long has the sanctuary been going now? 14 years. Okay. Man, I'm glad we're kind of jumping right into the uh, the Calvinism issue here, because you have a video called F-Bomb Calvinism and Calvinism Unlimited, which I absolutely love. And I'm going to highly recommend everybody go and watch this video. We can put it in the show notes. But um, yeah, would you share a little bit about that? Because uh, I have thoughts, uh, lots of thoughts. I actually think Calvin was really right on a lot of things. He was just way off on the numbers. Uh, and I lo- here's what I love. I love the way you present things with a really healthy satire. And uh, it's just refreshing. It's refreshing. <laughs> yeah the way that you have presented this. Could you just dig a little bit into your sure. your four point slash five point commentary there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. It's funny because I, I had an afternoon where I thought, I have a little time and I don't have anything to do. And I thought, well, I'll just kind of pull together this little video. But it really does get to the heart of what I believe. Growing up in the Presbyterian Church, my dad went to Princeton Seminary. And I should mention you know, my dad was part of the mainline denomination, and but became part of the evangelical Presbyterian denomination about 30 years ago. When it it's felt to me like in America, the a lot of the Christianity grew up just divided into two camps that are both kind of crazy, the a liberal side and a conservative side. Yeah, and 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 the church that I, you know, people that I grew up with that. They would say, "Well, we just love Jesus. We want to get together and talk about Jesus." I, I, it just I go. Where are those people now? But anyway, <laughs> yeah, we're here, I, right here, man. I, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I grew up with Calvinism, and I really like I like I liked Calvinism because the idea that somehow my decision could determine first whether or not I would be endlessly tortured by the Creator or whether someone else would be endlessly tortured by the creator was yeah. just utterly horrifying. Yeah. So the idea that, okay, God's the one that determines that and I don't have to was really good news. But then of course you have the problem of God creating people with that intent. So I, I really, I liked Calvinism because I thought Calvinism matched what I read in scripture and it was the best way to systematize scripture. But the one point, you know, and I do the five points and this middle finger is the problem, which is limited atonement. That was the one point that was really hard to find in scripture. And then I began to realize why am I, why would I want to find that point in scripture? And once you take, you know, so people will say, Peter, what you're saying is really complicated and they're trying to get out of the, that eternal conscious torment uh, model. But I say, it's really not very complicated at all. If you just take out this bad finger out of five-point Calvinism, you are left with this beautiful picture of a God who is raising his children and creating them in his image, and he does it through the atonement, and the atonement won't fail. And I've just discovered that basically all of Scripture can be systematized this way. So I think in my head and my heart over the last 20, 30 years, I've kind of been asking the question, sometimes more subconsciously, and then preaching through the text, asking, does this hold true in Genesis and Ecclesiastes and the Gospels and the Revelation? And, uh, you know, after a time of that, I began to realize, yeah, it does. Everything seems to make sense. So that's why I say I'm a four-point Calvinist. And, um, uh, and and it to me it makes the system rather simple. Uh, I watched it as well. That was the first time where I went, wait, maybe I am a Calvinist, <laughs> uh, because for me, for me, uh, the way and I just want to break this down. The way that and folks know when they listen to this podcast, the way I I've gotten to all things is through the context of relationship. I'm not an academic. I tried to be one, 
and I, I just suck at it. I'm an artist and I, I, I'm a guy that if you can't explain it to me and how it re relates practically with in the context of the relationship I have with my wife, my kids, my family, my friends, then I just can't even grasp it. It's just, it's lost on me. And what I loved is, is uh, when I understood uh, Calvinism, you know, you've got TULIP, right? I went to Bible college. I do know that much. And you have TULIP. And so you have total depravity right off the bat. What I was raised under was that that was somehow connected to my value. And you immediately went, no, no, this is not about your value. You're depraved of your ability to choose the good, yeah. which is, I'm quoting you now, uh, we cannot choose the good. And then you then to, to, to uh, highlight it even more, and again, this is me going, oh, I, I'm a Calvinist, because you started to talk about children. And you, and you to, to, to cement at home, you said children, babies, um, babies aren't able to choose the good, but we don't consider them valueless because they're, they're babies. Yeah, yeah. It's just the, the nature of, of what it is as we grow. And so to do that, then to go to unmerited favor and to call that grace that the, uh, the, that God, that the good chooses us, you begin to use language I can grab. And then, and then uh, I'm going to have you speak on this more because we understand it as limited atonement. And that's where I was out years ago when I, when I heard limited atonement, I went, well, that doesn't, I mean, that does, that's not how love works. Yeah, so yeah. sorry. I, I, again, it just doesn't work for me. I'm not a Calvinist, but you actually begin to describe it as a limitless atonement, which is of course going to tie us back into 12 years ago when you were wrestling through where that line was drawn in the sand, not being able to find it. Could you speak to maybe, I know the rest of it's irresistible grace and the preservation of the saints. You can maybe address that as well, but could you take us through this idea of limitless atonement? Yeah. I um, because I think that's the thing we're all curious about. So, you know, there are a lot of scriptures that talk about Jesus being the savior of the world, and he was the atoning sacrifice or the propitiation. I think it's First John 2, 2, right? Not not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Yep, yep. So there are several scriptures that just say Jesus died for everyone. And if, if you're a Calvinist, um, the, the other points of that five-point Calvinism, which ironically, Calvin never specified. It was his followers that did. Then it means that the salvation is going to work. He's going to save you. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, and I, and the, <laughs> this was a big thing in the Reformation, not just with Calvin, but with Luther as well, is that the thing we're getting saved from is our sin, which is a, which is a bad choice. It's a bad judgment. So, um, we're getting saved from our bad judgment with God's good judgment. Yeah. And that is effectual through the cross. That's what a Calvinist would say. And it's really also, I think what, what Luther would say, if you've ever read any Luther, like his freedom or freedom from the bondage of the will. I mean, read some of that in college. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the reformation is really this, this beautiful return to the very, I think the very name of Jesus. So the name Jesus literally means salvation or God is salvation. And the, the reformation was really all about, okay, um, the church kind of wedged itself in there and the church became salvation. So right. now we're going to go back to the idea that Jesus is the savior. And, and you know, w once you start learning about limited atonement, you have to ask the question, well, how come they're all of a sudden limiting it? And, uh, I think it's, I think it's kind of human nature and then struggling with the politics of what was going on at the time and, and our, and an understanding of hell that we interpreted through a thousand years of the church being dominated by the empire is you got to figure out how are we going to get people in hell and keep them there? Because with, with, without limited atonement, Calvinism basically says look, God is going to write this wonderful story of grace into the life of every one of his children. Right. And that story of grace creates faith, which I think is what a good free will is. And it's what every parent does with their child. You create right. this story right. of grace in your children, and you hope that one day they'll love you as you love them. Well, they, I think they had to realize, well, this means that God's going to write that story in every one of his creatures, and they're all going to be saved. So how do we get people into hell? And if you read, oh, what's this? Is it, um, I don't know. I have a few systematic theology books on my shelf. And I remember going to the shelf saying, how do they get to this limited atonement thing? So much of the argument is logical. 
But when you really boil it down to its essence, I think what they're saying is the atonement has to be limited because how else would God endlessly torture some of his own creatures? And um, I, I think that's the burden that the church has dealt with for the last 1,500 years. How do we, how do we arrange our theology so God endlessly tortures people? And I just don't think Scripture requires that. In fact, I think it eliminates that possibility at several points. So I'm rambling on. Don't know if that's the one where you want I, me to go. I love it. Yeah. No, no, that's that's real. It's so good. Um, I uh, I guess we would describe ourselves as Calvinish now at this point. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, it, it's just it's the thought of someone saying, "Well, how can I get people into hell and keep them there?" Just doesn't fit with my mindset of following Jesus. And I guess what really kind of, uh, you know, began to break it for me was just the simplicity of it's God's will that all be saved. And the uh, times in scripture, even I was reading today in Matthew, uh, when they were talking about the rich young ruler and uh, the disciples were like, you know, oh, well, how can any, how can anyone be saved when he did the, you know, the camel through the eye of the needle little uh, segue there. And Jesus said, well, humanly speaking, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And the way I just read that was like, yeah, humanly speaking, we were unable to save ourselves. That's why God became human. He became one of us to save all of us. And it was through that human context that he entered into our world and changed the game. And I have a very unpopular opinion about the Reformation. Uh, I don't think it reformed anything. I think it was just the largest church split in history. And and now we're in the process of bringing back all things under the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. And so that's my hopeful nature. But I really, really love the way that you present it. Um, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And... Um, you know, I, I just once again would encourage people to go and check out your videos. Hallelujah in hell and F bomb Calvinism. Uh we're just we're dynamite. I mean, I love Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the the one I the one I like is the flaming toilet of death. I don't know if you've watched that, but that's about uh punishment and discipline and and the fire and you you know, Derek, what you said about the Reformation is so true. I mean, I think right now in the United States of America, the Roman Catholic Church is more reformed than most evangelical or reformed churches. And so I think what I like about the Reformation is I think they started the right discussion, but then within a generation, they closed the discussion down. So in my denomination, which was evangelical Presbyterian, which I still really love, the motto, you know, in reformed churches is that we're reformed and always reforming according to God's word, because Calvin and Luther and the reformers said, hey, we're we're taking a shot at this thing, but the word of God has to keep instructing us. But within a generation, the reform, I think the, the reform, the reformation churches did just what the Catholic church did. And that is they succumbed to the power of the principalities and powers of this world. And the, the Roman Catholic church, of course, had been kind of dominated by the Roman empire since about 400, 500 AD. And the principalities and powers of this world run an entirely different system than a family system yeah. with a dad and yeah. children or a husband and a wife. And the the reason I think people would want to try to get people into hell, well, you know this as a preacher. You get to the end of your sermon and you have this incredible message to proclaim that is the gospel, which is just good news. It's just yeah. you, when you announce good news, you don't say, no, this is what you need to do about it. You just tell people and the news changes, folks. Yeah. But if you're part of an institution, you want to get people to give to the budget and you want them to go on the church retreat and you want them to come help pull <laughs> weeds in the garden. So you're always tempted to say, you know, believe this or something. Well, hell is a huge or something. Yeah, the biggest. And it's not that God won't discipline. It's not that God won't kick your butt if he needs to. But the institution loves to hang on to that idea. You need to make a decision by the end of this service, or it might be too late. You could die tonight, and God will endlessly torture you. That's Well, you know that as a preacher. I mean, I remember starting to preach through Scripture and trying to figure out what the hook was at the end all the time. <laughs> and over time, I felt like God was saying, Peter, there's 
I'm asking you just to give this news. Yeah. And the news, the the news, the word, it, it carries the power within itself. You don't have to con people into obedience. And I, I think that's why the institution really panics at anybody messing with the big stick that the institution carries. And we just don't need that big, God doesn't need that big stick and it's dishonoring to him. So what we end up doing is we get people to, um, what, uh, assimilate in our programs and do what we ask. And yet we create them to be terrified of their father down in their heart because we're holding this big stick. Well, and it's, it it messes with your understanding of what good means. Yeah. I mean, when we're, describing God as a good God. I grew up my whole life being told God is a good God. You know, preacher would say, you know, God is good. And everyone in the audience would say all the time and and preacher would say all the time. And we'd all say God is good. And then he'd go on to preach about hell. Yeah. (laughs) And, and what he would do to you. And, uh, you know, you know, if you didn't answer the door, you, you've yeah, probably yeah, seen the meme yeah. where Jesus is knocking on the door. Uh, it's a a picture and Uh who is it? It's Jesus. What do you want? He says, I'm here to save you. And the, uh, on the other side of the door from what, from what I'll do if you don't let me in. Yeah. That's an awesome meme. Yeah. Cause it, it really is the, this disparate idea that forces you to redefine what good means. I, we're talking with a lot of folks who would use the language right now of deconstruction. I, I would love for you to speak to that. Um, what do you think God's doing through that? But, but I, I've embraced the sincere desire to know the goodness of God that I see woven through the whole thing. And yeah. the, the folks that are done with the hypocrisies of, of a good God who will dangle you over hell to, to, to make you do this or to make you do that. And, um, yeah. you know, for me, my journey was one in which years ago, I came to a conclusion where I basically decided, I adopted this phrase, I don't know, but he's good. And and essentially, I decided that if I was going to live with mystery, it was going to be around what I didn't know, not around the definition of the word good and the nature of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Yeah. Often on this podcast, uh, to help people is, is, um, you know, I grew up in a church where, where all were in Adam, but not all were in Christ. Yeah. And uh, people are able to grab a hold of that. And I'm using Derek's. That's Derek normally says that line, but I'm pulling it from you, Derek, for this one. It, just struck, it struck me one day is how, how can what happened in Adam be universal, but what happened in Christ be limited? Yeah. And uh, it was there that my eyes started being open to some different ways of, you know, rethinking God. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I'm really excited about, what, what you just said. Yeah. And um, for, for me... Oh gosh, you just said so much about the goodness of God. So there's so many things I could say. Well, yeah, my dad was good. And so I thought, okay, Jesus, you said, pray our dad who art in heaven. So how could your father in heaven be this eternal torture? And it wasn't that I wasn't afraid of my dad. My, I, I was, in some senses, I was more afraid of my dad than anyone yeah. because he loved me. So if I screwed up my life, dad wasn't going to leave me alone. He was going to find me and, <laughs> um, and, and mess with me. And so I thought that, that can't be good. And then I also had these experiences, really wild experiences, some of them involving weird demonic stuff that it's hard to even tell people the stories because they think you're in crazy. And, and then studying scripture. And over and over, I would see God save these people through Jesus. And he was just so good yeah. in the way he did that. Yeah. And I started asking him, you know, sincerely, God, you did this for St. Paul. You did this from my friend who was raised in a satanic coven and right. told the most terrifying stories you could imagine. Why can't you do that for everyone? And I felt like over and over again, God kept saying to me, yeah, you tell me, Peter, why can't I do that for everyone? So you you dig into scripture. And so when I got defrocked, I was just saying, I hope this could be the case. Yeah. But I felt like God kind of pushed me out of the closet to say, I think it's time that we expose Satan's big butt. That's what I like to call it, because I think there's so much wonderful stuff in the Christian church and in evangelical circles about the love of God and and his relentless love for each one of us. But then all evil has to do is whisper in our ear, but hell. And and then it creates this terror where we have to act apart. And try to ignore the fact that, oh, yeah, we do have a father who endlessly tortures 
some of his own children. That I mean, that's a huge fly in in the ointment. But <laughs> but back to the goodness of God. Can I just mention this? Because this is the part I get really excited about. A lot of this really came to me while I was preaching through the book of Genesis. And I was a I was a geology major. So one of the most embarrassing things for me about the Bible had to do with the age of the earth and what some of my Christian friends said and what I knew just being a getting a degree from CU in geology. Um, but but when I oh man, I just said too much there. Um, let me say this. When I went back and started preaching through Genesis with an understanding that space and space and time are relative constructs. And I began to take scripture literally and the garden story literally. And by literally, I don't mean according to our concepts of space and time, right. but according to the author's intent in the story, I began to see really the most, I think the most beautiful things in the Genesis story. And that is, I think the cross is integrally related to the two trees in the middle of the garden at, at the story. So the cross is the story from the very beginning and the thing that the cross reveals is the goodness of God. But in order to understand the goodness of God, we have to have an encounter with the opposite of the goodness of God. So the goodness of God is what he wills. And the opposite of what he wills is really desecration or non-creation. It's, it's evil. And God is walking us through, I think, the story of our own creation. I think the beautiful thing in scripture is that that, that we miss is that we're still in the process of being created. And this is really the sixth age or sixth day of creation. And the creation gets finished at the boundary between space, time, and eternity, which is this tree in the middle of the garden where the word that God speaks cries, it is finished and <laughs> we're forgiven. And he makes everything good. And it's like, so the crazy part is I think the evil one has had us twist the beauty of the cross into this terrifying threat when in reality it's the revelation of the heart of God. And it's so, it's so simple in one sense. And that is that God is saying, look, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you a blood transfusion. You're, you're watching me create you with my very self. And the thing that I'm creating in you is I'm giving my heart to you so that you will love as I love. And then you will be grateful. Instead of being proud, you'll be grateful. So for me, gratitude then becomes the key to living in the kingdom of God because it's my it's my ego. It's this old man that wants to justify himself that makes life miserable for me. So once I can let him go, that old Peter, and I can live in the new reality who who, who is somehow unified with Jesus, then I'm free. And that is what Paul's talking about, I think, in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, as in Adam all die, that's all the this humanity that tries to justify itself. So in Christ will all be made alive. Mm -hmm. And it's just the most, the, the best, most beautiful news, because I think everybody, because like kind of that sloppy universalism that just says, oh, yeah, God yeah, feels yeah. great about everybody and doesn't matter what you yeah. do. It leaves everybody empty because you're like something, something is really, really wrong with humanity and something's really, really wrong with me and my neighbor. And I think the message of scripture is, yeah, you're half made. You're not finished yet. Um, God is going to destroy what's evil and he's going to create what's good. And you're watching, you're observing your own creation in Christ Jesus. And in the end, you'll see that absolutely everything is a gift of your father and he you you can't even hmm. begin to comprehend how much he delights in you and i should that that goes but i had a weird experience years ago where i kind of had an encounter with god and um i think that's what what i saw is just like his goodness is beyond anything we've understood yeah so sorry i went off there but god is absolutely good and your love is Hey guys, I'm interrupting this podcast for just a minute so I can invite you to partner with us by giving to A Family Story. A Family Story is a 501, a nonprofit, and it's our ministry. And it's what allows for me to produce this podcast and other regular content. 
We've been living this faith journey for a long time, but 2014 was when we officially stepped away from the traditional pastoring approach to full-time ministry. It's been fun. This journey has been wild. And this last year was no less faith-inducing with COVID affecting travel and speaking. And it's been good because, hey, we started a podcast. Our passion is to create content catalytic for an encounter with the always good, transforming, reconciling love of our Heavenly Father. And so our heart through this ministry has always been that through speaking, writing, film, and music, we're relentlessly sharing the goodness of our Father, the good news. Your giving goes directly to support this podcast, as well as written content, discipleship content, teaching small group messages, articles that we release weekly, and also the book I'm writing. I'm excited about what I'm chasing down right now. We appreciate all the support, whether it's sharing, writing a review, following us, signing up for our email list, or financially. We just love being on the journey with you. If you want to give to A Family Story, you can go to afamilystory.org, afamilystory.org, and click on the Give button. All right, thanks, guys. Let's get back to the podcast. This has been my journey, and I and I use this story quickly. I think I've shared it here before. The the, the measureless nature of, of God being love. Uh, I I use the story of nighttime with my my youngest to describe it, where I'll say I love you to the trees and back, and then she'll say I love you to the trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, and back. And we play this game where we try and measure our, our affection for one another. And and years and years ago, she said, "Daddy times two after I'd given her a litany of yeah. my love, you know all of my imagination and she uses the smallest multiplier of two, <laughs> the, you know, the, yeah. the, the, best, the best multiplier she knows at five years of age uh, and, and blows the whole thing up. Yeah. yeah. And I tell the story to say, this is, this is the journey we're on. It's one in which we're awakening to, uh, to love in the context of, of, of time and space. We're here in measurements. We do measurements really well and it's not a, it's not wrong. But love is this measureless revelation. Mm -hmm. And we know it when we play a game with our, 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 our five-year-old at night and just try and measure. Our, we love the game because we realize you can't measure. The moment you think you've got it, your five-year-old can say times two. Yeah. And my understanding of the nature of God has been that. It's been encounters with him that have opened me up to this measureless revelation. And when I began to apply it to my understanding of salvation and heaven and hell, uh, I would say this has been my trajectory, and I'd love for you to speak to it. But my trajectory has been one where I started with hell is the absence of God. That was what I was raised under. And of course, I learned, uh, even though I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. That's what David says. Even though I make my bed in hell, you're there. Neither death nor life, neither angels, nothing separates mm -hmm. me. So as I grew in the reconciling nature of the love of God, and, and, it, and I got this times two expression, I, I went on to go, okay, hell is not the absence of God. It's the rejection of his love. And I think, well, that's true as well. I think you could say that we, we've seen that and, and you, and, 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 you just talked about the ability to choose, to have free will. I would say freedom is the soil love grows in. There's two trees in the garden. So I, I could break that down. But I'm, I'm even further along in my journey now. And I would actually say sometimes uh, we don't have good fathers. I had a good father. You had a good father. Sometimes life happens. And our, our ability to even reject isn't even there. We are just reacting. We're just responding. We're just doing the best we can with what we've got. And hell feels like absence. And, and, and some might call it rejection, but I think it's just the reality of, of us doing our best to survive. And uh, uh, this is where I'm getting to. What I was taught at one point was, was that all are in Adam, that all are in Christ, as though time itself is bigger than the nature of love as though we get to the end of this life and somehow we run out of time before we before we have been able to say yes or before we've been able to respond and what does that say about the nature of love love actually then has to bend its knee to time and time yeah. is actually our god and that's where i come to this conclusion god is love his love is measureless he's better than i thought he was yesterday and and and, and yesterday he was better than i thought he was the day before and it's times two, and yeah. I'm convinced at this point, people say, ask me if I'm a universalist, and I'm like, well, probably not in the way you understand it, but I'm a universalist in, in the nature of his love, Yeah, and I don't know how else 
to articulate it. So yeah, probably I am a universalist. Yeah. I, I would love for you to maybe make sense of what I just said, because this is where I'm at. I don't have any conclusions. I'm, I'm just convinced he's better than I thought he was. And I'm open to the possibility that God's a, re- a relentless redeemer, not just in this life. Yeah. Yeah, the idea that God is one rather than two. that That's something we've really missed. But right. yeah, you said so much there, Jason, that's so good. So let me, and this is a, a little bit of what I t- kind of try to explain in Hallelujah in Hell. And let me mention this. There, there are so many different things that are now coming together in culture that are, are really making it possible for us to rethink our view of God. And one of those is is modern physics. So the physics that I grew up with, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the idea that uh, space and time is all there is, that all there is, was, or ever will be, that Carl Sagan used to say. Yeah. Well, now uh, all physicists will say, well, that's that's silly. That's just not true. And even Carl Sagan knew that wasn't true when he said <laughs> that. So we've lived in this tyranny of space and time as we experience them. And yet the biblical view of God is that God creates space and time, and he really lives outside of space and time. So when it gets to the question of hell, you have to ask yourself, well, where is it? Is it in space and time? Is it in the earth? And if Jesus is the beginning and end of everything, that would mean he's the beginning and the end of space and time. Yeah. And so so where's heaven? Where's hell? So the way I see it is that there are there are really two concepts because you saw this video that get translated in different ways or thought of as hell in in scripture the idea of Hades or Sheol is a huge idea in the Old Testament. Sometimes it gets translated hell. Sometimes it gets translated grave. Just seeing that should tip everybody off that, hey, people really don't know what they're talking about. In my understanding, that's the perceived absence of God. So David in hell, he says, right, you know, your right hand holds me. So God is there, but we don't perceive him, right. and which is really a lot like C.S. Lewis's picture in The Great Divorce that hell is this prison that I really create for myself with unbelief. And I think it continues after the body dies. So that the psyche, the psyche is the, is its own prison and that can continue after, after death. The thing that rocked my world was years ago, preaching through the revelation and realizing that at the end of the revelation, death and Hades get thrown in the lake of fire and death is no more. Well, that means Hades comes to an end, and Scripture says Jesus is the end of all things, and it comes to an end in the lake of fire. That means the lake of fire cannot be Hades. It's the thing that destroys Hades, and when you study that, it, it's interesting that the word brimstone is this Greek word theon, which can be translated divinity. Sure. So the lake of fire and divinity, or lake of fire and brimstone, I think is like it's like the very substance of God. So, and this shows up throughout scripture. It's fascinating, but scripture will repeatedly talk about God as a consuming fire. And then the priests, they if they mess around with unauthorized fire, they get toasted by the fire. And yet some people aren't burned by the fire. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walk around the fiery furnace with this fourth guy. Moses goes to the burning bush. There's this fire, but it doesn't consume the bush. He's amazed by that. A fire comes down from heaven and consumes Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet the very same fire is what uh, the angel appears in, and then Sodom and Gomorrah, or Sodom, gets recreated again. Ezekiel says it will get recreated. And when fire falls on the temple, I mean, fire is everywhere in the Bible. Yeah. But once you entertain the idea that maybe the fire is God, well, then Gehenna is, well, The lake of fire then is the opposite of Hades. And this is the nutty part. We've described hell with two things that are the exact opposite of each other. The the manifest presence of God and the manifest absence of God. Yeah. Back to the space-time thing. Hades is seen as in the depths of the earth. It's part of space-time as we think of it. But the fire, like that shows up in Matthew 25, the fire on the altar, is eternal. And I think what eternal means, this is huge, people don't get this a lot of times, is technically in Greek, the word means something like of the age. And I think it's saying it's of God's age. It's like a categorically different kind of experience of space and time. And that's exactly what physicists now 
talk about, that there is this reality beyond space and time as we understand it. Well, if we are going to an eternal kingdom and we are getting filled up with eternal life, um, well then, and, and scripture will talk about an eternal punishment. Well, I think the eternal punishment is God himself. He's eternal. So it's his presence that is torment to to the the ego that I hang on to that captures me in Hades. And then this other concept is really important too. There's one last word that gets translated hell in the New Testament a lot, and that's the word Gehenna. And Gehenna, you know, is the valley around Jerusalem. Jerusalem yeah. And to get into the city, you go through Gehenna and they used to burn trash. Brad Jerzak talks about Gehenna a lot. But to enter into, and, and the inside of the city is eternal, and it's a picture of a temple. This is so cool. It's all throughout Scripture. The inner sanctuary in the temple was seen as eternal as well. So the outer courts represent this age. That's what the book of Hebrews says. And when you go into the inner sanctuary, you go through like a space-time barrier between space-time and eternity. Huh. So Hades, in the I think the biblical view, Gehenna is that, is that transition or it's it's judgment. I think another explanation of it that I talk about in the video is the cross. And that's why Jesus gets crucified at the sixth hour, the sixth day of the week, the end of the sixth day of creation. And on the other side is eternity. It's like the boundary between those two things. So gosh, where did we start? Oh yeah, so we're talking about what hell is. Well, <laughs> the Hades that is that, manif that manifest absence of God, I think that is a place where the human psyche can get stuck in this world. Yeah. But in Scripture, Hades comes to an end. And not only that, Jesus descends into Hades and leads captives free. And we've had some wild experiences dealing with that kind of stuff, praying for people. But then the my somehow my eternal life with God is a different understanding of space and time. That, by the way explains a whole lot of really confusing end time stuff because people are always writing these maps trying to explain the end times right. and and then just are mystified when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, that eternal reality is all around me right now. Yeah, yeah. But I'm hiding from it within my psyche. So that so Jesus said you have to lose your psyche for my sake and the kingdom in order to find it. It, it, he didn't use the word life. He used the word psyche. And I think that's my construct of reality. And I have the old man, the old psyche, is a psyche that believes Peter Hyatt is salvation, the one that I have to justify myself. It's my, it's my resume. It's, the, it's my ego, my pride. But my true self knows that God is salvation. It's, it's at home in the presence of God, my creator. I cannot exist in the pres in the unadulterated presence of God, my creator, and believe that I am my own creator. Yeah. That gets destroyed by the goodness of God. And years ago at a crazy conference in Canada, I had that experience. In the morning, God, this is the one time I've heard audible words in my head. God revealed to me that I'd gone into the ministry because I hated the church, because I had seen what the church had done to my dad. And all yeah. at once I knew I did this in order to protect my <laughs> ego and get back at the church. Yeah. And I had never, I, it was like a completely new thought to me. And I just utterly fell apart weeping for like an hour uncontrollably. Wow. <laughs> and I remember thinking I must have had a nervous breakdown or something. And I went back to this meeting that night to make a long story short, God literally nailed me to the floor and I felt like a million volts of electricity were shooting through my body. And I <laughs> thought he was going to kill me. And I was so excited because I was just so happy because he revealed he, and this he said in a different kind of way. But he, I think he said to me, Peter, stop being a dork. And and I said that to the lady who was praying for me. Jesus just called me a dork. And she said he would never <laughs> call you a dork. And inside I'm like, no, he totally did. And I totally get it. Because he was saying, stop being a dork and doubting my my love for you. And like yeah. in a in a moment, I just saw my whole life, he was constantly loving me. And the love Oof. was so intense. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, God, if you turn this up one more notch, I'm just going to go up in flames. And so that day, to me, describes, I think God was like showing me, look, Peter, 
this is what I'm doing with all creation. So you go through this horrifying experience where you discover that everything you thought was so righteous about yourself is actually really pretty gross and ugly. And it's all about your ego. And then at the end of the day, I burn it all up and shower you with my love. And it was just a, such a cool. And, the, and the, after that experience was over, I found myself unable to worry for like a month. I, I, I'm a worrier. So I'd lie down at night and and normally i'm just lying there forever trying to get thoughts out of my head and i would just instantly fall asleep because i just knew he had me utterly surrounded yeah it wore off after about a month but i felt like god was kind of <laughs> saying this is where we're going this is what i'm doing and i'm taking you on a journey and so back to your point it's it's the goodness of god and this is what i was saying God, I think what God did that day, he exposed the Hades, the Sheol that I had created for myself. Yeah. And then I had an encounter with Gehenna. And on the other side of that barrier is like, yeah, I mean, I've really struggled with God. I, I just wish you would like nuke the world and with your fire of love and get us home right now. But I trust that he has a, he has a purpose. And, and this goes back to that garden. This is, Sorry, I'm talking too much, but I really think he's the whole, the whole tree of the knowledge of good and evil is ultimately a picture of the cross. And that when we, what the, what the Pharisees, the religious people did, and when they crucified Jesus is they tried to take life from him. And that's what we all do. We think life belongs to us. And that is knowledge of evil. Yeah. Knowledge of evil is believing I have to justify myself. And knowledge of good is God saying, I know you took it, but I also gave it. And I I am your creator and I constantly give you life and I give you my life. And so it's coming, it's coming back to the it's in our ignorance. And, and this is really the story of every little child. And a little ch child doesn't know what they're doing, but they end up hurting their parents and their parents end up forgiving them. And that's how you shape a child in your image. And that's really what's happening with each of the children of Adam, which of course means humanity, is God is saying, I'm going to give you an encounter with evil, and then I'm going to reveal my good, and my good is life. And when I give you life, then you will be grateful for life rather than, rather than arrogant, because it's our arrogance that creates all, all the division and evil that that we produce in society. You know, I, I, man, I just, I, I hear God's love is an all consuming fire. Yeah. And uh, going back to what you said, you know, cause I hear this so often, well, God is love, but yeah, you know, he's also holy. Yeah. And I'm like, well, okay, well, you know, show me a, a holiness void of love. And uh, you know, I'll show you a Pharisee. Um, God is love, but he's also, you know, he's also just, and I, I think they, they miss the point of this, this beautiful diamond of love that has all these facets um, that express themselves in, you know, justice and mercy and holiness and, you know, all these other things that we try and wrap our minds around when in reality, it's, it's his all consuming fire of love that is beginning to shape us into his, his image and, um, and creating a new creation. Yeah. Um, and, and bringing us back to, you know, original intention, original design, but even better than original. Um, only, only God's love can do that. Well, and that's where, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's where my Calvinism jumps in. And I go, yeah, actually his original, everything I think is going according to plan. That's a shocking reality. But I think that's what Paul says in Romans. Um, we're preaching through Romans now, and I, I love that book. It's kind of been like a backbone for me. And I finally got up the courage to preach through it. But, you know, that's a book that people use to, to scare the poop out of other people. But Paul's <laughs> point reaches a pinnacle in Romans eleven thirty two, when he says, you know, God consigned, he consigned all to disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all. And I go, I think that's the story of the garden. Like God knew what he was doing when he put two naked, ignorant people in a garden with an evil talking snake. Folks get all wrapped up in, well, can you go find that garden or whatever? And I'm like, I hope one day there could be something like that. But that's not necessary because Adam means humanity. It's a story of of every it's a story of every one of us. And from the start, God is and it's part of the sixth day of creation. God is raising his children 
it's really all going according to plan. Um, God doesn't will that any of us would not do his will, but he wills that we would encounter the opposite of his will and learn learn of his love. And in, in that process, he creates within us the ability to love or implants himself in us. So it's, it, he is good. As a communicator, and, and I, I'm talking to two communicators, I, I'm, I really love how you put things together, the, the, even the, the art, art, artistic approach to some of the, the videos that you've, you've done, uh, Peter. But I, I, hearing you tell your story and ha- hearing God call you a dork is maybe my favorite part of that story <laughs> because God speaks in the, la- in the language of our understanding. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's, you know, he's the best communicator on the planet. And I, I, I can point to certain experiences in my life. I've also been on a floor where electricity was shooting through me and, and uh, had just profound conversation with my heavenly father. And, yeah. and uh, it was humorous and back and forth. In fact, at one point he told me he, he thought I was funny. I made a joke and he said, you're funny. And yeah. I yeah. love to tell everybody yeah. God thinks I'm funny, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. because of that, that moment uh, with him. But I, I, I just appreciate that, it, that all of this comes out of that place of, of a relational context in which uh, God is pursuing you, pursuing mm-hmm. you. I'm writing a book right now, Leaving and Finding Jesus. And really what I'm going after, uh, I use the Emmaus Road, but really what I'm going after is is the fact that God, being the most excellent communicator like Jesus, will show up on the road that you're walking down and will we'll step inside any body, including a body that doesn't even know Jesus, to reveal Jesus to you Yeah, because he's really interested in this burning place. And we don't actually have an exit Jesus. We don't know. We know what he spoke from scripture, but we don't know. We don't, we can't break it down and, 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 and give it away because we don't have that. What we have is a story about an encounter with a man who revealed Jesus to these guys. And I, I asked, I, I've set all that up to ask this question. I, I had a friend reach out the other day and they're calling me and they're navigating through what they would call deconstruction and reconstruction. That's a, a big, a big uh, thing that's happening right now. And I started to, hint at it earlier. And she actually asked me, she said, I'm wrestling right now with, with even what I know about Jesus. And, and for me, because of my own personal relationship with Jesus, because he has met me on every road I've walked down, because he is like you continue to address the ego, uh, through his kindness, you know, it's the kindness, the goodness of God that actually leads me to repentance. To me, um, I heard her talking about a repentance journey, and I don't, I, I would, I couldn't believe I was saying this to her. I said, "Listen, if if Jesus is a, is a word that's too tough, just go with love." We were having that conversation. Just go with love. There's no greater love than this that 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 a man would lay his life down for his friend, or that a person would lay a life down for another. Go with that. If if we're there, you're safe there. Just go there, because I'm convinced he's walking down the road with you. But I would, I'm convinced that repentance is simply that. It's it's the turning from our poor thoughts about who he is to better thoughts about who he is, and discovering that in Christ. But I would love for you. To, to speak to the deconstruction movement, to speak to um, what you see is happening right now. Yeah, I went, in fact, when Derek was talking, I had a, I was trying to remember the thought that I was thinking because you started saying it, Derek, and I, I thought it was so, it was so good. Is I do think there's this deconstruction going on right now, and I, I mean, with the, you know, the political situation, situation in America is crazy and around the world, and it feels like, at times, it's felt like God, you are blowing up the church. And so I think that, I think that deconstruction is good. And when you look at the old Testament, it's fascinating how over and over again, God will, he'll have the Jews build Jerusalem and then destroy it. (laughs) And then lo and behold, it shows up all brand new in the end, which is so cool. But I I think there are several uh, factors in the deconstruction. So we kind of talked about the space time thing, I think kind of going back and dealing with some of the stuff that happened in the reformation I'm really excited that scripture is so much more accessible to people now that you can go online and um, go to Bible Hub or whatever. So you don't have to take a bunch of Greek classes in seminary. Yeah. So the deconstruction has happened. And that, the thing I worry about is that people will lose faith that there is a reconstruction on the other side. And of course, the reconstruction is only in our minds. I think I've 
I have a whole lot of confidence, not because of some ideological position that I took, but really because of experience, that Scripture is remarkably, um, uh, what am I trying to say? I, I, authoritative is the wrong word, but it's it's a remarkably reliable witness to who Jesus is. Yeah. And once we go back to Scripture, having deconstructed, I, I want to give people faith that Scripture, Scripture was saying something beautiful all along, and <laughs> yeah. because we walked into it with this wrong paradigm, we go to the cross and we we have bad penal substitutionary atonement theories in our mind, yeah. and we think that's what the Old Testament was saying. But if you go back in the Old Testament, it's not saying that at all. In fact, you know what? That's what you were saying, Derek. You were talking about what holiness and justice is. When you really start analyzing it the way we've looked at scripture just is ridiculous it just doesn't make sense scripture talks about god's holiness as his forgiveness that's the thing that happens in the holy of holies is atonement and right. forgiveness and, and even when you really dig into the old testament the god you find there is one that loves all of his creation and is infinitely compassionate over all of his creation but he will discipline us um severely if and and this is this is where the hell thing becomes so important if in the back of my mind i think that when old testament people dies they are now going to be endlessly tormented it's utterly preposterous but if on the other hand i think oh no that's just part of everybody has to die that's part of their construction process and if i believe the old testament prophets god is going to make them all new in fact isaiah I think Isaiah is the most amazing. If you get to the end of chapter 66, most terrifying verses in all the Bible, the people in Jerusalem walk out and they look down on the corpses of those that have rebelled against God. When you follow Isaiah, all of humanity has rebelled against God. And it's the bodies of all people there in the Valley of Gehenna. And the people that walk out and look at those bodies are also all people. And they start praising God. If I take Isaiah very literally, the only way I can understand that is that one day I'm going to walk out in a new body and I'm going to look at this 60-year-old body <laughs> burning up in, in flames in my new body and just praise God for what he's done. So all of that to say, I think the deconstruction is good unless there's no reconstruction. And, and the reconstruction, I think, is just going back to the original text I've always remembered what someone said. They said, any jackass can kick down a barn, but it takes a skilled carpenter to build one. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Jesus is a skilled carpenter. So going back and seeing Jesus everywhere in the Old yes. Testament, in my mind, is just, I love the Old Testament yeah. now. I used to never read it. Yeah. But I love it because yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's Jesus again doing yeah. his doing his thing. You yeah. know? <laughs> and and it's not that it isn't terrifying, but but you're you, you guys are dads. I, I mean, I remember when I've got four kids and when they were two over and over again, it felt like God's whispering in my ear. Hey, Peter, this is you. This is what a you know, something would happen to the kids. And they thought that I hated them. It was the end of the world and they wouldn't they wouldn't live any longer. And I knew that in a few hours, they'd be happy and we'd be playing in the backyard again. And I think that's the message of scripture, that God is dad and we all will die. He told us that right from the first chapter, but it's all part of God making everything good. So to me, the the big story of scripture is right there in the first chapter. And that is, um, we're headed to this place where everything is good and it is finished. And right now you're in the process of being created in my image. Yeah. Yeah, so good. So the thing I get passionate about is the reconstruction, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So, you know, we've had a few we've had a few conferences at our church, and I think a whole lot of people are just kind of focused on help me deal with this hell thing. And then what's what kind of breaks my heart, and I guess this is part of the process, is some people will say, "Oh, well, I don't have to worry about endless hell anymore. I'm out of here. I'm going skiing or whatever." <laughs> and, you know, and I'm like, "Well, maybe that, maybe that, you know, maybe that's the junior highest stage of Christianity <laughs> or something." But I'm hopeful that the church comes back and says, "Wow, let's sing about this and worship this and look at Jesus because he he really he really is beautiful." And for me, there's this beautiful reconstruction on the other side. So yeah. 
I've, you know, you asked about my stuff. I've got a couple books that I did on the first two chapters of Genesis. The first one's called The History of Time and the Genesis of You. And the big thing in that book, I think, is that we've missed the this big story that God is making us in his image and he won't fail. And the story of fall and redemption is part of that story. So once you make the doctrine of salvation part of the doctrine of creation, um, it everything just gets filled with this profound hope wow. that uh, is not uh, that that's not fleeting, but is steadfast. The, yeah. the second book has to do with the fact that Jesus is the great bridegroom, and we really are his bride, and we become his his body. And then I feel like before I die, I need to write this third book called "The Tree in the Middle of the Garden" because I really think that there's this amazing story going on with the tree and that we all have to do business with the tree in this life and the tree is the is the cross so i'm i'm hopeful that there's a reconstruction on the other side of this that's really beautiful and a a bunch of things i think are coming together in society having to do with space time our view of scripture and kind of the deconstruction of the old um the the old systems and structures of, of the church that i'm hoping that's Hoping that'll happen. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful too. Yeah. And yeah, I really feel like the hopeful reconstruction um, is kind of the way I see it is like it's okay to completely burn down the building, just burn it to the ground and raise it, but there's going to be a cornerstone that remains, and that cornerstone is Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and that is a place that we can safely build upon again. And uh, that's what I've done. I've gotten back down to that simple cornerstone of Jesus. Uh, You know, the best way I could give this example would be, you know, when a 1957 Chevy rolled off the line in 1957, that was a great vehicle, great car. But when someone restores one, uh, it's better than original. Why? Well, we have better radios, better paint, better tires, better. You literally can make something better than original. And I'm probably a crude example, but I think that's what, what God has done with us in the new creation and by becoming one of us demonstrating his empathy, you know, who, what creator becomes his creation and remains his creator. Yeah. And that, that just speaks to our value and the love that is, is so necessary for us to be able to reach other people. You know, we just don't, I just tell people this all the time. I'm like, don't lead with you're a sinner and you're going to hell. Zero of that is good news. It will never be good news. Uh, why don't we lead with the love of the Father and the kindness that draws people to yeah. metanoia, repentance, change your mind? Yeah, you know. And uh, and then I just think I think all of reality is steeped and based in love. Yeah, that you're not even able to see or perceive reality without love at the basis of it. Yeah. Well, the, and there's this fascinating uh, little line in Romans 6. Uh, sorry, I've been working on Romans because we're preaching through it. I love it. But, uh, you know, Paul says that Jesus is a, that, that the first Adam was a type of the one who is to come. And, of course, the one who is to come is is Jesus. Who, If you take some of this stuff just literally, that Paul says all of creation is going to be united somehow in the body of Christ with Jesus as the head, and certainly all of humanity. And he says that he is a, that Adam is a type of that one, that one that is coming. And the the word type is fascinating because it's this word in Greek that it's referring to the mark that's left by like if you smack someone in the face and you leave a mark on their face, that's a type. Or it's like if you take a figure and you press the figure into clay and then you pull the figure back, the imprint of that first figure is the type. And so he's saying that all of us are a type of, of Christ, that my, even my sin, even the empty old ego man, the old man, is created by the true man being pressed into that clay. And then when, when he's when that's removed, like we're made, and then and he is love. He's, he says he's the manifest presence of love. He's love incarnate. Well, when he's removed, well, we understand what evil is. Evil is the absence of love. And somehow 
even my sin and my ego and my evil nature then become like that then god fills that type that tupas he fills that empty space and i um ha, i my even my sin becomes a theater for the revelation of grace so where sin increase grace abounds all that much more so that one day in heaven we'll see each other and you'll say hey that guy looks like peter hyatt but he's like made of an entirely new substance <laughs> and i think that's the somehow the substance of jesus so um the, the huge mystery to me is well god who are we we live somehow at the boundary between this this type and jesus himself and when peter's when paul says it's no longer i who live but christ who lives in me I'm thinking, wow, I think he actually meant that. It still blows my mind as to what exactly that means. But, but well, yeah, I mean, he's I, so good. he uses all of it. I, I mean, I like to think of it that when he said the mystery of the entire gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yeah. Like who does that not pertain to? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and so now I go looking for Christ. I know I go looking for the image of God in every person and yeah. uh, begin to call them to their true identity. And love is a really good way of doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so much makes sense. So Matthew 25, for instance, makes sense that way. When he says, whatever you do into the least of these, you do to me. Why? Well, because I'm in, I'm in the least of these. And yeah. so judgment is happening all the time. Um, cause, cause eternity, there's eternity in the heart of every person. And so you talk about God to people and talk about love to people. They all have an idea of what you're talking about, but they have no way of defining it because it's it's that thing from the age to come that's implanted in us. I think that's exactly mm. right. Yeah, so good. So And then they may go skiing. They just may go skiing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And God still loves them. Yeah. And and that'll be okay. I love that God called you a dork. Yeah, yeah. I seriously think that's the best thing ever. Like, yeah. is it? kid who grew up in the 80s like i can so resonate with being, with being a dork yeah. yeah and uh yeah thank you for that that was actually a prophetic word for me today <laughs> well I, do, do I, you don't have to record this but I, in all honesty this also happened a few months ago he called me an idiot and this was the weirdest <laughs> thing of all because we're praying for this gal dealing with all this stuff in her past and um weird demonic stuff and my wife and i'll pray for her and you know, I'm Presbyterian. I'm not Mr. Charismatic or something. But I discovered that when the evil one would manifest in her, I could pray in tongues. And it, it really bothered him. And eventually he would let he would release her and she would begin hearing Jesus speak through me, which really freaked me out because I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then she would tell me what he'd say. And I go, whoa, that didn't come from her. That was really Jesus in me. Well, a few months ago, I had posted something online about how we're all um, idiots, but God loves us anyway because we're babies or something like that. And this guy got really upset with me. He was another pastor, and he had said, God would never call us an idiot. And I felt really bad about it. And I said, oh, but you got to understand, my dad used to call me an idiot. And then he would laugh, and it was like this term of endearment. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I was feeling guilty about this. We're praying for this friend. I'm praying in tongues. She's beginning to hear Jesus talking to me through here and all of a sudden she just starts laughing and she says oh i'm sorry jesus just called you an idiot and i said <laughs> what she said oh no please understand it wasn't mean he meant it like in an affectionate kind of way and then he laughed and and i said oh you don't have to apologize for that that is like such good news to me that god would call me an idiot and not only that he did it through my voice he said because I was sitting there thinking, this is so weird, God, that she understands. And I don't know what I'm saying. And she said, yeah. He said, he laughed and he said, this idiot doesn't even know what he's saying. And he said it through <laughs> my voice as I'm talking to her. And it was like the most encouraging thing to me because I'm like, okay. A term of endearment. I can yeah. be an idiot. I can do, I can do yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think that's real. I think that's really, really he, he really does that. He, I had a friend at church too. Sorry if I mentioned this one, but he, this, cause we talked about that at some Bible study and it's not like I hear this stuff all the time, but he was praying about whether he should marry his, his uh, wife. And he had all these questions about his own righteousness or whatever. It's a long story, but he said, 
the reason he decided to propose is he was asking all these questions and he said, I heard God say to me, it's not about you, dumbass. And then <laughs> he uh, realized, oh, you're asking me to. <laughs> and I, I, and it, you know, I, and I think that's exactly right. God is so personal and he's not going to say that no. to someone who would be yeah. traumatized yeah. by it. But my friend Chachi is like, okay, I get it. I know exactly <laughs> what you're saying. But he called me an idiot. I'm like, oh, thank you. That's what dad used to always say to uh, me. You, you know me, you love me. And I, I think that's what's so cool about God is that he really is. What, that's a dumb thing to say. Everything's cool about God, but that he's that personal. Yeah. So uniquely interested in each one of us. Well, he knows what it's, yeah. he knows what it's like to be you. Yeah. 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 And, and I'm incredibly insecure. I really am. And so for him to say that was wonderful. I yeah. love that. You know, I feel often out of my league whenever I'm talking, we start getting into the the, the high end theological terms and such. But but I, I love that um, we can do that. And then and then it ultimately comes down to that actual uh, context of the, the real life of ministry and, and loving people and hearing God speak in and through us yeah. uh, and, and realizing that, that we are, we are a part of a family that we are, that God is love and that we are on a journey. Yeah. I, I, for me, yeah. that's probably the most encouraging uh, way by which maybe we can close this is the, the nature of this whole conversation is that we are on a journey. We are, we are in process. We are actually being transformed. Uh, it is a finished work, but we are in the process of awakening. I, I, I love that, uh, that picture that you're taking us back to Genesis to even reveal that to us, man. I, I'm so thankful for your time here. I don't want to keep you too long, but we are rethinking God with tacos. You did talk a little bit about a taco story on the front end, which uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I may use, yeah. but uh, I, I thought I'd give you a little more time or another shot at it if you wanted to. We need, uh, we need, what we need you to do is, is tell us in descriptive language that will get our mouths watering your most delicious taco that you've ever. Eaten. I love tacos. Well, I don't know if this will get your mouth watering, but when I was a youth pastor in Southern California, we used to go build homes in Tijuana, you know, and we'd go with a missionary and he'd scope out the street vendors to see which ones would kill you and which ones he thought you could have. And you'd just be after a hard day's work and you really didn't know what the meat was. And then you'd have one of those street tacos and they were amazing. They were, yeah, and this is, and they were effing good. And that's the name of the taco <laughs> shop down the street that they say it in Spanish. And when we planted the church, everybody was going to that taco shop and saying, and then they realized, <laughs> oh, that's what it stands for. But they're, they're that good. But the, the ones in Mexico from the street vendors were just, they're amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, I mean, part of the reason we're rethinking God with tacos is because we're all about uh, we want we want to go into the deep stuff, but we don't want to get too serious at the same time. What, do Do you remember Brendan Manning used to tell a story? It was in one he, he wrote where God he said one of his characters said on Judgment Day, God won't ask you about atonement theory. He'll ask you, did you enjoy the fajita? So, you, and I thought, well, that's a fascinating. You might, you might ask you, did you enjoy the taco? Like, that's bad stewardship <laughs> if you don't enjoy that taco, right? Uh, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that would segue to another. Uh, Brennan Manning was a played a huge role in impacting uh, me uh, 17, 18 years ago. My dad actually, uh, it sounds like we have similar relationships with our dads, but my dad actually, when a book changes him, he buys it for everyone. And so, yeah. Uh, so I had, a, I had several Brennan Manning books, uh, and, uh, along the way, but is there any, uh, in that light who, who's influencing you? Who, who, who do you read that you go, Oh my God. Yeah. That maybe, maybe you could say this and where I feel like I'm, maybe God has something for me to do on planet earth, you know, uh, is, well, that's stupid. I'm being facetious, but of course he does <laughs> for each one of us. But yeah, Brennan Manning was 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 hugely influential to me. Long long, and we would have him sometimes come speak at our church retreats and stuff. So I got to know him a little bit. Yeah. And then uh, Tony Campolo, I just love Tony Campolo. Yeah. We'd get him to come speak, and um, he, uh, I I just thought Tony was brilliant, and and I told myself I wouldn't research any of his stories before I told them because he probably had embellished them in wonderful <laughs> ways. Um, 
and then uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz was a big influence on me okay. quite a while ago. Okay. And then uh, theologically, I think uh, Karl Barth, not that nobody can read all of Karl Barth unless you're total egghead, but a lot of what it really helped me yeah. systematize things. Uh, I really liked Soren Kierkegaard's stuff. There's a little book, Provocations, that was a compendium. It's been real in, influential and you know, a lot of the, and I, and Philip, Philip Yancey yeah, had a big yeah, impact on me. Yeah. And he kind of, he was actually part of my church before this whole thing blew up. So I still talk to Philip okay. once in a while. Um, wow. So, but, and, and then I think what, it was funny because I'd watched some of those guys that I knew. Tony Campolo wrote the, uh, gave me a great review for one of my books, but I remember Brennan Manning people would say, Hey, are you a universalist? And then I would watch Brennan just backpedal trying to figure out what to say. And so they were really influential for me because, because I think I'm a systematic thinker. It's just the way yeah. God made me. Yeah. Um, not necessarily real intelligent, but the pieces just have to fit together <laughs> for me is I'd hear Brennan Manning or I'd go to some, um, great church retreat like men at the cross or whatever and at the end of it i would naturally think yeah but yeah but hell and that for me i mm. i've thought gosh peter what you're doing is you're going back to scripture and you're just trying to see whether what brendan manning said is true or not and i'm saying i think it is and i hope that maybe what our website our, our relentless love website which is relentless dash love.org could do for people is people that are just wrestling with, well, how do I deal with this verse, this verse, this verse, trying to have sermons that we preach through all those different verses to give people courage that this isn't just wishful thinking, yeah. but this is also the testimony of scripture. I love that. I was going to ask you that next. Where, where can we find you? So relentless love. Yeah. Re well, <laughs> It's kind of a little bit like our Sanctuary Denver website. Relentless Love has all sorts of connections with it, too. So you got to remember relentless-love.org. And um, we just uh, we have this website where it has a, all sorts of sermons and then also mm -hmm. ways to kind of help. There's a few catalogs under the sermon yeah. uh, heading, and I have kind of pulled together these catalogs that one of them is like um, sermons that seem to oppose the idea of relentless love. And the idea is just to help people. Well, this is how you can go back and um, listen to the story of Jesus and, and Lazarus. And it actually is incredibly encouraging. So you, yeah, my hope is that people wouldn't throw, they don't think they have to throw out the Bible. In fact, if you go back to the Bible, it's the very best defense for these ideas that we've been talking about. Any Twitter or Instagram or anything like that that you participate in? Yeah, we have a, a relentless dash love Facebook page um, okay. that that w we'll post things on. And I haven't kind of gotten into the Twitterverse and all that stuff. Part of part of the challenge for for me is how do you address these things and keep doing doing church uh, yeah. because you know i don't think there are a lot of worshiping congregations where they'll talk about this openly and so i felt like part of what i was called to was keep doing church but also have this conversation so um you, you know like i know of like brad and baxter and those guys they're well baxter friends able to focus on these ideas a little more in, intentionally but yeah. Anyway, that, yeah. between church and all this, I'm kind of overwhelmed <laughs> with stuff to do. I totally get it. But you know what that's like. Yeah. Yeah, totally yeah. get it. But it's, it's so I'm so glad you have this podcast. It's great to meet you guys. So good to meet you. Yeah, really, really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it's been awesome. We will uh, definitely connect again. But it is thanks for having, coming on yeah. and sharing with us. And man, it's it's been an honor to talk with you. Oh, it's uh, my honor. Hey guys, thanks for listening. We, we love doing this podcast. Uh, if you're looking to find us, Derek. Yeah, you can find uh, our church at rivercharlotte.com. Uh, me personally, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all the places uh, at Pastor Derek T. 
Twitter.com. And it's good. It's really good. He's a Twitter savant. You really got to follow him. <laughs> uh, I do Twitter as well. I'm not as good at it, but my handle is uh, at Jason Clark is. Uh, you can find us uh, at a familystory.org. That's uh, the name of our ministry. And uh, if you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get weekly emails with uh, articles, weekly articles and the podcast information. So you can find the podcast on Apple, yeah. iTunes, Spotify, all the places you can get podcasts. Type in Rethinking God with Tacos and we'll be there. That's exactly right. And also, uh, like, share, retweet, and, uh, and man, if you could write a review, it, it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, it does, it more yeah. Available, so. But a five-star review, of course. <laughs> yes. You know, if you can't write a five-star review or something, <laughs> like, just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that. And then apply that to this <laughs> podcast, definitely. That's my motto. That's I like what it. I do. <laughs> so, love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless.